presentation. <clears throat> my name is Stephen Shelby. I'm the coordinator for the cultural affairs here at Oak Island. Um, and I didn't think that as many people would show up, but after talking talk with Mr. O'Connor, we thought that we needed a big stage like this for everybody to come in. And we appreciate it. <clears throat> the parking was fine outside, right? That was good. <laughs> okay, um, we're working on that. We're working on that. Um, I just want to come up and thank all of our sponsors. Um, for helping to make this event possible. And we just read those names off. We've got Tanager Place, we've got the African American Resource Committee, we've got the African American Museum of Iowa, Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust, Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Museum, I mean, Commission, Cedar Rapids Community School District, Lynn County Board of Supervisors, Marion Civil Rights Commission, the President's Fund of the Greater Cedar Rapids Foundation, and of course, the College. <clears throat> so, without further ado, I now want to introduce Mr. O'Connor. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Friday morning. Good morning. I am really appreciative of everybody coming out today. It's cold outside. Yeah. All right. I get the pleasure of introducing Adam Foss this morning. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing Adam last year in Boston, and I immediately after that conference said, I've got to figure out a way to get him. Cedar Rapids to come share his message here. Adam is one of the thought leaders in this country on criminal justice reform. He is passionate about this topic. He is, there's a couple of TED Talks he has, I'm sure you may have seen them. One has over 2 million views, which is really impressive. So you think you're trying to get somebody to like a picture, think about trying to get 2 million people to like a video you did, think about that. Um, but again, he has met with the leaders from all over this country, all political leaders from, from all over the world sharing this message, um, had the pleasure of having dinner with him last night and hearing some of his journey and hearing some of his stories around what he's done and what he's seen. And this is a person who is committed to making our world better and having that impact. And so I am very happy to have him join our community today to share his message. As with no further ado, Mr. Adam Falk. Actually, flown a million miles in the last. 
last two years. And because I've flown a million miles in the last two years, I'm like triple, quadruple, platinum status <laughs> on everything. And as the triple, quadruple, platinum status person, you get sort of sit where you want, get a plane where you want. So um, I'm an aisle person. And that means that comes with like one set of responsibilities that actually is the only thing about being an aisle person that stinks is that you have to get up anytime anybody wants to move to the bathroom. Um, and because I'm the first one on, I can sit in the aisle, but then I have to get up for other people to get on the flight with me. And so, um, just a month ago, being an aisle person, I stood up, because a nice young woman came to the aisle to sit down, and she sat down, she sat in the window, we exchanged pleasantries, and I went back to reading my book. And then shortly thereafter, I got up again, because a young man came to the aisle, and I had to get up, and he sat down, down in the middle seat. And we all exchanged this glance with each other because for me, in a million miles, it was the first time that I had sat next to two black people on an airplane. In fact, I've flown on lots of transcontinental flights where there were no black people on my plane. And I can't remember the last time that I sat in first class with a black person that wasn't an athlete or a musician. I've had the opportunity to speak at about 90 colleges, law schools, graduate schools around this country over the last two and a half, three years, and I have yet to go to one that has an African-American population of 5% or greater. I've had the opportunity to sit in the C-suite offices of some of the top Fortune 100 companies in this country, Amazon, Airbnb, Google, Uber, you name it, I've been there sitting across from the Bill Gates, the Mark Zuckerbergs. And when I'm in those offices where millions of dollars are being exchanged, typically the only people who look like me are the people who are serving coffee and taking out the trash. I've had the opportunity to attend some of the best conferences this country and the world has to offer. TED, Davos, Skoll, Nantucket Project, you name it, I've been there. These conferences people pay tens of thousands of dollars to go to just because of who you get to see speak at them. And typically when I look around in the audience, the only people who look like me are the musical performers who are about to go up on stage. And when I look around in these spaces, I don't really have to ask myself where everybody is that looks like me. Because I know where they are. I see them every single day that I do the work that I do in jails, in prisons, in impoverished neighborhoods. Not because they're not trying hard enough, but because structures have been put in their place since the beginning of this country to keep them there. And unless we're prepared to think to ourselves that somehow the people sitting in first class, the people going to college and law schools, the people who are going to those conferences, the people who are sitting in those C-suite offices are more creative, more ambitious, more intelligent, more driven than the people that I meet every single day doing my work, then we need to have a very difficult conversation about what is going on in this country. Because I can tell you, every time that I see an empty seat in one of those spaces, I think about the people that I've seen in jail and prison in impoverished neighborhoods because we are depriving ourselves of their talent, their intellect, their creativity. By the end of this talk, I hope that you never look at an empty seat again, particularly empty seats in the face of power and privilege. Because mass incarceration is depriving us of bodies that should be sitting in these chairs. It's not just an African American population, it's every marginalized population you can possibly think of, including rural or white people. But today I'm going to focus on the thing that I know best, which is the, the experience of African Americans in this country. It reminds me, when I look around, of the images that we have of 50 years ago in this country, of the treatment of people who look like me. I think about the images of four little girls who went to a church one day and never came out again because somebody threw a pipe bomb into their Sunday school just because of the way that they looked. I think about the images of a 15-year-old boy who was beaten so badly that his mother had to wear it all to keep his casket open during his funeral so that the rest of the country could see what the Deep South had done to her son. I think about the images of three young boys who looked like me hanging from trees in the public square lit on fire just because they had too much melanin in their skin. And when I look at those images, I'm not just struck by those four little girls, I'm not just struck by Emmett Till, I'm not just struck by those boys hanging from trees, I'm struck by all the people standing around the periphery watching it happen. I find myself shouting at the images, what are you doing? 
Why are you just standing there? I would have done something. Couldn't you have done something? But every time that I leave a conference that I've seen some amazing speaker at, every time I leave one of those C-suite offices for the check as a donation, every time that I leave one of those colleges and universities having a good time speaking there, and I don't say something, that I'm just as complicit as those people standing around the periphery. And while we've graduated from lynchings and bombings and murders and segregation and disenfranchisement, we've just evolved to mass incarceration. And unless we have a very, very difficult conversation about mass incarceration, we're the same people who are standing around the periphery watching this happen on our watch. And we're about to hand this legacy to these young people right here. We're going to give it to them to finish the biggest human and civil rights crisis of our time happening in our country every single day and we're just going to hand it to them i'm sorry 2.3 million people in jail and prison right now another 5 million on probation and parole one misstep away from being part of that larger aggregate one in three black men born today will spend some time in jail or prison. I've already got my time out of the way. One in three black women today will, will, has a relative in jail or prison. One in three children living in this country under the poverty line is a white child. The United States locks up four times as many white men as any other country on the planet. There are 70 million Americans out here with criminal records. 650,000 people come out of prison every single year, only to be faced with 50,000 collateral consequences of felony convictions that impede their reentry into society. And this isn't just a criminal justice issue, it strikes at every political and social and economic and, and health metric you can possibly think of. The leading cause of death of young black men in this country, 18 to 35, is handgun homicide. That is not true of any other people in any other place on this planet, except the United States of America. It causes so much death, it makes up more death than the next nine leading causes of death for that same age cohort combined. There's a place on this planet where a black woman is 12 times more likely to die during childbirth than a white woman. It's not in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's not in the West Indies somewhere, it's in Manhattan. A black woman in this country, one out of every three will experience an eviction in their lifetime. The staff of their white counterpart is 1 in 22. And when you start evicting moms from homes and their children, there's only one place that they go. Down the spiral of the cradle of prison pipeline. That's how we destroy communities. There are more segregated schools in this country today than there were in the evening and round versus board of education. Until this year, there was more representation in Congress of people who looked like me in the period of Reconstruction immediately following the Civil War. And to put a fine point on it, researchers think that about 12 million Africans were enslaved, captured, and killed in the entire transatlantic slave trade over a 400 year period. Last year, 11 million people went through our jails. That's the state of our union. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to be talking about people who look like me as an endangered species pretty quickly. And we cannot afford that. We have to do something. We need a new civil rights movement. I don't know why the last one stopped. A lot of people blame the inertia and the lack of leadership. We're waiting for the next Malcolm, we're waiting for the next Martin, we're waiting for the next Rosa, someone, anyone to come and take us to the promised land. But it doesn't come. And every day that we wait, Millions more of us are arrested, thousands more of us are incarcerated, thousands more of us die. We cannot wait any longer. The good news, and there is good news, is that when I look out in this room, particularly in these first few rows, I don't see just a bunch of people from the middle of the highway. I see the new civil rights leaders of our time. When I was 19 years old, I remember standing across from a police officer and handing him thousands of dollars of cash that I had wanted over the course of that summer. And I remember handing him the little scraps of marijuana that I had left over from the pounds that I was trafficking between the center, center of Pennsylvania and back to Boston. 
I remember standing in front of the police officer and him looking at me and me registering the look in his face of one of contempt and disgust and frustration that I had become a statistic. And I remember looking at him and thinking to myself like, ooh, I'm in trouble. But despite the fact that I was a black man in the United States of America standing in front of a police officer having just been caught drug trafficking in the 1990s, here's what trouble looked like to me. My mom and dad are going to be really mad. They're going to take away my brand new Razor cell phone. <laughs> you remember that, right? No. They're going to take away the pickup truck that I bought for myself for my 17th birthday with my landscaping money. And I remember the other dude who got caught on campus selling weed, he had to move all the way across campus. That was trouble to me. But for anyone else standing in my position, here's what trouble should have looked like. What I'd done was a federal offense. I didn't know that. I knew I was breaking state laws, but I didn't know that one of them carried with it a 10-year minimum mandatory sentence. Because of that 10-year minimum mandatory sentence, the likelihood I pled out to that case was about 100%. And pleading out to that case, I would have given myself a moniker, convicted drug felon. And by doing that, I would have deprived myself of all the things that actually keep us safe. The access to housing, the access to employment, the access to education, the access to pro-social activity, the access to health care, transportation, child care. And because I deprived myself of all those things, the likelihood of committing another crime actually went up not that one. And each time I re-engaged with the criminal justice system, the likelihood I commit a further, more serious crime went up not down, until I victimized another person, at which point, the government would send me to state prison for double digit decades, and I never had the opportunity to be here. I didn't realize how close I was to the edge of a rabbit hole that millions of people fall down every single year and don't get the opportunity to be in rooms like this. I didn't realize how easily, if that police officer wanted to, he could have pushed me over the edge and down that rabbit hole I would have fallen, like so many other people that I've had the honor and privilege of meeting over the last three years. But I didn't. I'm here. I got to go back to college, in my own pickup truck, with my Razor cell phone. My dad. That's the best part. Thanks. Good night. I graduated from college. I went out in the workforce. I worked for three years. I came out of the workforce. I went to law school. I went to law school for three years. I graduated from law school. I went to one of the most prestigious DA's offices in the country. I worked there for nine years and had a wildly decorated career. So decorated, in fact, that one day, John Legend called me and was like, hey man, you want to do a TED Talk? I was like, hell yeah, John Legend, I would love to do a TED Talk. <laughs> I did a TED Talk and blew up on the internet for the last three years. I've been traveling the world, the country, with every celebrity and artist and athlete and activist you possibly think of talking about criminal justice reform. In 2015, I had the opportunity to sit with the 44th President of the United States in his house and tell him what I thought of his criminal justice policy. Last year, I got to sit in Oprah Winfrey's house and listen to Oprah Winfrey tell me how dope she thought I was. Oprah. <laughs> I found out in the last six months I have a rap lyric, a children's book, and a documentary all made about me. I don't tell you any of these things to home for. Oprah. <laughs> Obama. Kendrick Mark, did I mention? I tell you those things to make this point. None of that happens. None of that happens if I don't win the lottery. None of it happens if I don't win the lottery. The lottery that I won, the police officer pulled me over, pulled me over my driveway. The police officer pulled me over was a white man. The police officer pulled me over was my dad. And after he took me down to the station and put me in a cell and let me sit there for a little while, he took me home and he loved me. Just like he did every time I screwed up after that. Just like someone did when you screwed up. Just like maybe we should talk a little bit more about in the criminal justice system. Love your fellow brother or sister. That lottery ticket I won, I was born in a violent, impoverished neighborhood. I spent three years in an orphanage until one day two lovely white people from suburban Boston came to pick me instead of the other kid. I got to go home with live them. I lived in their middle class home. I went to their middle class school. I had middle class friends, and that protection of privilege kept me from the bottom of the rabbit hole. That's it. And the fact that I meet people every single day who are much more deserving to be up on this stage, who are much more deserving to be in this room, 
but they're stuck in jails and prisons, yes, because of their own decisions, but also because of the structures that they grew up in, the fact that they didn't win the lottery and they get to be there and I have to be here. That disparity in chance just because of the lottery ticket drives me crazy. And I hope it drives you crazy too. Mass incarceration isn't just affecting the people who are in prison, it's affecting every single one of us because we are deprived of meeting those people because of the luck of the drug. I didn't know it at the time, but standing there in my driveway, my father was handing me a sword and shield. The shield was just a protection, a privilege, that would keep me out of the criminal justice system for the rest of my life. The sword was for the haters. Because believe it or not, there are some haters out here. There are people who still tell me to this day that I should have gone to prison for selling their kids weed on campus in 1998. There are people who talk to me about how my young people need to have accountability, but as soon as I start the conversation about how everything that we have in this country, everything that this country was built on, was built on the genocide of one people and the enslavement of another, the accountability conversation all of a sudden ends. People always ask me, how many, how many chances are you going to give these young people? And then I ask them, how many chances did you get? Or how many times did you just not get caught? The sword is for the haters. who try to take the privilege, a little bit of privilege that I gained. What I also learned about the shield was that I didn't have to just protect myself from it, that it was expandable. I could protect whoever I wanted with it, whatever that meant. And I didn't know it until I became a prosecutor. Here's the good news. You don't need to be a prosecutor to have a sword and shield. Every single one of you, by being part of this community, by having the power, privilege, and opportunity, whatever it was that brought you here, you have a sword and shield too. All you have to ask yourself is, what am I going to use it, who am I going to use it for, and how brave am I going to be when I use it? Because oftentimes, it's the people that we want to help the least that need it the most. I'll just give you one example of how I used mine. I met Stanley for the first time when he was 16 years old. He came to my courtroom for stealing a cell phone. Apple, in its infinite wisdom, was trying to make it easier for us to return our cell phones to them when they upgraded. And so they put vestibules all around our city where you could put an iPhone in and it would spit out $60. Well, that created an economy that the young people in my city could participate in. Because lo and behold, the days of like getting a landscaping job or a babysitting job or a paper route are gone. And so Stanley was participating in the economy that was available to him. And there I was, Mr. Woke Prosecutor, and I said something to the effect of Stanley, this is bad. You're a bad kid. Don't steal. It's bad for you. You're never going to come ever anything if you steal. You're bad. Get out of here. Stanley went home. A few months later, Stanley came back, this time not for stealing a cell phone, but this time for stealing a Vespa. He graduated to stealing a Vespa. You guys know what Vespas are? No? Okay. For those of you who don't know what Vespas are, Boston, like every other city in this country, is undergoing a rapid wave of gentrification. And with the gentrifiers came their gentrifier starter pack. First, it's the craft beer and kale store. <laughs> then, it's French Bulldogs named after authors that none of these people have read. <laughs> and then, there are little red scooters that they drive down to their tech jobs and take up our parking spots, and that's a Vespa. But what they didn't tell the gentrifiers at the Vespa store is that the Vespas are really, really easy to hop on. Red, red wire, green wire, go. And Stanley lives in a neighborhood where there is a fence that you can drive behind with a Vespa and somebody will give you $100 and never ask where it came from because they're going to chop it up itself. And that's what Stanley did. And there I was again, Mr. Woke Prosecutor, two degrees, smarter than Stanley, telling Stanley what to do. Stanley, you're bad. What did I tell you? What did I tell you, Stanley? Now you have two thefts. I should send you to prison right now, but I'm woke.
so I won't. Get out of here. Stand left. I was committing a fundamental fatal flaw that many of the adults in this room have or will commit in their lives, and thinking that the degrees that I had made me smarter than the young people that I was working with. I didn't take the time to stop and listen to Stanley, and if I had, maybe we could have avoided all this unfortunate situation, but I didn't. So the next time, Stanley came to my courtroom, this time he came through the back door, not the front door, this time he came in an orange jumpsuit, handcuffs, ankle shackles, and a waist chain, all tied together in the center. Because Stanley that weekend had posed as someone on Craigslist interested in purchasing motorcycles. Two men, at two different times, responded to the ad, drove pickup trucks from suburbs with motorcycles on the back of the pickup truck, picked up Stanley and his accomplice in our neighborhood, and then Stanley convinced them to drive to the back of an abandoned golf course to test drive the motorcycles. When those men took the motorcycles off the truck, Stanley's accomplice would raise their jacket, reveal what appeared to be a firearm, and Stanley would tell those men to get back in their cars and leave, and they did. We went from stealing cell phones to stealing vespers to two counts of armed robbery, two counts of possession of a firearm, two counts of assault with a dangerous weapon. One of those is a life sentence. You stack all six of those charges on top of each other, there's not enough numbers to count how many years they were facing. So I started to listen. I said, Stanley, can I, can I talk to Stanley first of all? Can I talk to him? So Stanley and I went to a conference room with his attorney, and I asked the guard to take all the handcuffs and ankle shackles off of Stanley. And then Stanley asked his attorney to leave the room. Don't worry. For those of you who are cringing right now to think about a prosecutor speaking to a person accused of a crime on the day after they committed the crime. Don't worry. I didn't really have to do much investigating because Stanley had done all the work for me. <laughs> Turns out, 17 year old Stanley wasn't very good at committing crime. In fact, he used his own email address stanleyvargas98 at gmail.com to set up a Craigslist office. That after Stanley the motorcycles, he looked so good riding motorcycles. That he couldn't help himself. <laughs> Stanley posted pictures of himself on the evidence, date, time, and location stamp of himself at the scene of the crime. So my job was pretty much wrapped up. No, I wanted to know, like, how did we miss this? What happened? What didn't I get the first two times around? Stanley didn't tell me about the gang he was jumping into. He didn't tell me about the gang he was trying to jump out of. He didn't tell me about some weird motorcycle stealing ring that I had missed, where he would sell the motorcycles to get money to buy drugs and guns. He didn't tell me about any of that. Stanley told me about when he was nine years old, how his family emigrated from the Dominican Republic. And if nine years old, he recognized the sacrifice that both his parents were making to put your lives in the DR to come to Boston to get Stanley to buy drugs and guns. He didn't tell me about any of that. Stanley told me about when he was nine years old how his family emigrated from the Dominican Republic. And at nine years old, he recognized the sacrifice that both his parents were making who had pretty good lives in the DR to come to Boston to give Stanley and his two other brothers a shot at a better education. And Stanley told me at nine years old, despite the fact that he had grown up in a developing nation, that he had never seen violence and poverty and trauma the way that he did when he moved into the Dallas Project in Boston. And how that violence and that poverty and that trauma started to seep through the cracks of his project building and started to pick away at his family. First, it came for his oldest brother. His oldest brother stopped coming home after school, and then stopped coming home after curfew and then sometimes just wasn't coming home at all. Stanley would see him out in the street all dressed up in all these nice clothes. Stanley didn't know where they came from until one night the federal government let them know where they came from and they kicked down Stanley's door, arrested his older brother, and sent him to federal prison for drug trafficking at 19. Same thing I was doing. It then came for his next oldest brother, Stephen, Stanley told me that Stephen and he were really, really close in age, 
and they played together their entire lives in the Rough House. They were best friends until they got to the United States and the Rough House got a little bit rougher and then became violent. That violence manifested at the school and manifested out into the street until one day Stephen was involved in a gang shooting. And he went to prison. Stanley said that Stephen always seemed a little bit off, but his parents were afraid to go get a mental health treatment because their paperwork wasn't in order and they were afraid of getting deported. Stanley told me about how that violence, that poverty, that trauma continued to creep through the cracks of the project building until one morning he woke up and his father was gone too. Back in the Dominican Republic, defeated and ashamed. Stanley told me about coming home, finding his mother laying on the ground, crying and throwing up, not because she was sad, not because she was sick, but because she was so exhausted from trying to keep everything together, not being able to speak the language of working through jobs. Stanley told me about the feeling of putting $10,000 on his mother's table he got from some of his motorcycles, rubbing her back and saying, I've got you. I've always got you. You never have to work. I was like, I understand that, Steve. Like, I get that. But you have to, you have to know you can't rob people. Weren't you afraid? Weren't you afraid of the police? Weren't you afraid of going to prison? They want me to send you to prison right now. Stanley looked at me and he said, Is that what you think? Is, is that what you, do you think that when I was out there robbing those guys, the criminal justice system even entered my mind? I was worried about my mother dying. Do you think when my friends strap up in the morning, we put guns in our pants, we go to school in the morning, we're worried about the 18 months of the house of correction we might get if we get caught? No. We're thinking about dying. We're thinking about getting caught without one. Stanley leaned back in his chair and he said to me, Bro, a criminal law is for the land of the living. We're out of here trying to survive. The best piece of legal education I ever got came from a 17-year-old kid in an orange jumpsuit. Not from a $150,000 piece of paper that now sits on the wall in my office. And for that gift, I felt compelled to return. So I reached out of my pocket, and I pulled out my sword and my shield. I said, all right, Stanley, I need two things from you. I need first for you to tell me where it is that you want to be. Like, where do you want to be in life? So I said I want to graduate from high school. My parents gave up everything for me to graduate from high school. I just wanted to walk across that finish line. And you know what else? I love baseball. Baseball makes me feel good. I want to play baseball. I can't play at school because I'm not getting good grades. No one's trying to help me out, but I would love to do that. And you know what else? I live right next to Northeastern University. I see all these young people enjoying our schools and having a good time. I want a piece of that too. At the end of the day, whether I'm playing pro baseball or I'm a college graduate, I want to buy my mother a house and go out the hood. Raise your hand if that sounds like the life plan of a violent serial felon that needed to go to state prison for 20 years that day. So I said, okay, Stanley, number two, I need you to write me a list of all the things that you need to do right now for, to get to from where it is you are right now to where it is that you want to be. I'm going to write you a list, too, of all the things that I need you to do to be accountable for the actions that you just committed. So Stanley wrote a list. It went something like this. Go to school every day. Be on time. Do I'm going to write you a list, too, of all the things that I need you to do to be accountable for the actions that you just committed. So Stanley wrote a list. Went something like this. Go to school every day. Be on time. Do my homework. Come home on time. Practice. Play. Be nice to my mom. Be nice to my friends. Be nice to the police. Don't be a pain in the ass. My list looks remarkably the same. Except at the top, number one, you've got to get the victim stuff back. Because we were having this intervention, within hours of the crime happening, I knew that we could go and get the victim stuff back, and we did, with Sammy's help, we gave it back to the victims. And after that, they were pretty much all set. 
Number two, you're going to apologize. Not in the way where 18 months from now you're going to be standing across a courtroom and I'm going to write, read the police report of the things you did and you're going to say, yeah, I did that. No, no, no. You're going to apologize to these two men, so have you, if not to someone that will find that has been victimized by crime because I want you to understand the harm that you've caused. And it's not just going to be the words that you say, it's going to be accountability and action. You're going to do community service every day until your hands are weak. But it's okay because I'm going to be there with you. An adult is going to be there with you that cares about you, that wants to see you succeed. Anytime that there's an academic lecture or book reading that I want you to go to, you're going to go, but don't worry, there's going to be an adult that cares about you that wants to see you succeed right there with you. Anytime that there's a documentary screen, there's a speaker that I want you to see, you're going to go, but don't worry, there's going to be an adult that cares about you that wants to see you succeed sitting right there with you. You're going to write, you're going to reflect, you're going to write essays about this, you're going to understand what it means to be accountable and the harm that you cause. And you're going to do this every day until I say stop. And I'll say stop when you cross that first finish line that you set up for yourself at high school graduation. But for today, for today's day, you're going to go home. And you did. That was me exercising my sword and my shield. You have the opportunity, the power, and the privilege to do so. And frankly, responsibility, otherwise we're going to head in the wrong direction. Because Stanley and the tens of thousands of people who I've met in prison or who are living in impoverished communities that are right down the street from ours have lived a pretty predictable life that all of us can be involved in if we choose to do so and stop the hype. We've learned a lot about what it takes to do it. How to stop it. And very rarely is incarceration the answer. Because what we know now is that children who are conceived to mothers living in communities where there's toxic stress happening to them inherit that toxic stress while they are baking. It changes the way their DNA develops, their bone structure develops, their socialization develops. And we can trace those changes in utero all the way into the criminal justice system. Those are unborn children telling us, if you don't focus your resources down here, if you don't get creative down here, if you don't care about me down here, I'm going to go to prison, but we wait. Those children are then born in the same communities their mothers were suffering toxic stress, and guess what? They start suffering it too. We call them adverse childhood experiences. In fact, 75% of the young people who are locked up in the Massachusetts detention facility today, 75% of them have had, on average, three interactions with the child welfare system the age of three. Let say that again. 75% of the kids who are locked up in Massachusetts have had, on average, three interactions with the child welfare system before the age of three for abuse, neglect, and malnutrition. Those are children, nonverbal children, telling us, if you don't do something down here, if you don't put your resources down here, if you don't get creative down here, I'm going to go to prison. Wait. And those children who are in the first grade in those communities, in the first grade in those communities, those children have been read to, on average, 18 hours. Their counterparts in more affluent communities, and I'm talking literally about just across the street, have been read to, on average, 1,300 hours before they get to the first grade. Children in Sam's community have heard 30 million fewer words by the time they reach the first grade. The children in more affluent communities, then you think about the quality of language they're hearing. That gap. In literacy, that gap in cognitive development, that gap in threat is showing a kid and loved them enough to sit down with them a half hour a day and read to them, leads to you guessed it, early problems in school, or we interaction with the juvenile justice system, early action in, in the child welfare system. Those children then continue to go to those schools every single day. They move on to the next developmental period in their life and they go from learning how to read to learning from reading. Learning from reading is what we do for every day and from the time that we're eight years old until the day that we die. And if you haven't learned how to read, it's very difficult to learn from reading. And when you're eight or nine or ten years old, it's very frustrating when you're getting evaluated on doing something that you had no, no part in the failure to do. And that frustration builds up in children. And because they are children, not because they're black or brown or poor, but because they're children, they cannot articulate the frustration that they're feeling. 
And so it manifests in behavior. They act up, they act out, they run around the class, they have their heads down, they're the class clown, they're the class problem. And what do we do as adults when we see those children acting that way? Do we apologize to them? No. We label them. We blame them. We shame and expel them. Suspending a kid, particularly a kid of color between the ages of 8 and 12, increases the likelihood that they drop out by 50%. We send a message to them every single day from the time that they start failing in our schools. The same exact message that they've been getting since they were conceived, your life matters less. We don't have the time for you. We don't have the money for you. We don't have the resources for you. You're a bad kid. You're a bad kid. You're a bad kid. Those are the good kids. Those are what the good kids look like. Those are the good kids' grades. You're a bad kid. You're a bad kid. You're a bad kid. And they hear that message every single day until they become adolescents. And at that time, when we are biologically engineered to figure out who it is that we are, we hand them the autonomy to decide whether we want to come back to the building anymore. And when they decide not to, when they decide to drop out, our test scores go up. Our school spirit goes up. We're glad to see you go. Because they're the problem. And then those kids, when they're disengaged from school, they do something that the kids who stay in school, the good kids do, that we sanction and we support. They find kids who are just like them. It's what we're biologically engineered to do as adolescents. Every single person in this room has some clip that you hung out with in high school. And when you're in high school, we call that a team, a club, a troop. But when you're black or brown or poor, and you do that out on the street, that same exact biological adolescent need, we call that something else. We call that a gang. And when members of that gang, not because they're bad, not because they're black, not because they're brown, not because they're poor, but because they're adolescent young people, and they're adolescent young people who have finally found people who love and support and protect and accept them, when violence is visited upon them or someone that they love, they respond with violence. Because they live in a community where it's easier for them to get a handgun than it is to get a part-time job. And then when they respond with violence and they do something bad, that's when we say as adults, okay. Okay, young person, now I have all the time. Now I have all the money. Now I have all the resources to pay attention to you. To lock you up and to throw away the key. Shame on you. Massachusetts, at 17 years old, if you commit a homicide, you get a life without parole sentence. We will, in, in accounting for life expectancy, we will spend $11 million on you after you've committed a murder. But the suggestion that we take that money and put it down somewhere around three to six, and just make sure you get across that finish line, that's a joke to us. Where do we get as a society that we'd rather spend money in warehousing someone that's done something bad? as opposed to chopping up that money and spreading it out in our communities and saving kids' lives. That is not a part of the legacy that I want to leave to these kids. Each one of us has the opportunity to do something about that tonight, tomorrow. I'm not going to sit here and list all the ways out because I just listed the pipeline. Figure it out. Read, vote, volunteer, visit, do what you want, but spend some time just trying to make the life of one young person better. Because when you do, when you exercise your sword and your shield, the results can be amazing. Shortly before my meeting with Obama, did I mention that I met Obama? <laughs> Shortly before that meeting, I had the opportunity to go to a much more important meeting. Uh, I sat with a young person as he signed his letter of intent to play Division III baseball at school in New Hampshire. A few months after that meeting, I got a text message from that young man. He said, I did it, bro. He said, what did you do, Stanley? Stanley became the first freshman in his college to start as a pitcher in the national championship game. 
He threw eight innings, 11 strikeouts, two hits, they lost, but the value that he felt being that person on that mound today was better than anything that I could possibly describe to you today. A few months after that, he texted me again and said, bro, I think someone's playing a trick on me. I said, why do you think that, Stanley? He said, I got a piece of mail. Stanley had never received a piece of mail for this date that wasn't a warrant or a summons. And on this date, somebody threw a slit of envelope under his dorm room door, and when he opened it, it said, congratulations, Stanley Vargas. You're on the dean's list. Stanley is an honor student at his college in New Hampshire. He's a junior, and he's studying criminal justice because he thinks he has something to teach people. Standing up there in the left hand corner, for rookie of the week, telling it. But I can't tell you, as a prosecutor, how it feels for that to be my win as opposed to sending Stanley to prison. And if there's anybody in this room that thinks that we are more safe having Stanley locked up in prison somewhere as opposed to being a junior in college with aspirations to be something greater, then I would love to hear from you. Because this is the result of doing something just different. I know it feels odd culturally, but it's not just Stanley. Every single one of these men in this, in this photograph were young people that I prosecuted for firearms, for guns, violent crime. And 95% of them are now in college or fully employed or both. I've lost a couple, one to one side of the gun, the other to the other side of the gun. One's in prison and one's in the ground. And I hate that. But I have to tell you, if I sent all these young people to prison for doing bad things, my scoreboard looks much, much different than this does. This is how we solve this problem, because someday these young men are going to be in these seats or maybe even up here. We have the opportunity to do it every single day. In fact, we have the responsibility to do it because we have the power and the privilege and the opportunity. And with that, we have to give our shield to someone else. And we have to. Because 50 years from now, we're going to be looking back on this time the same way that we looked at 50 years ago. We're going to be looking at images that we are number one in mass incarceration. We are number one in mass shootings. We are number one in racial and ethnic disparities. Every metric that you can possibly think of, people are going to be looking at those images and asking, what the hell did you do? Why were you just standing there? I would have done something. And in 50 years from now, when people are asking those questions about you, how is it that you want to be with them? Because Dr. Martin Luther King said, in the future, it's not the words of the enemies you remember, it's the silence of your friends. So when someone asks you, what did you do? Why were you just standing here? Do you want to be remembered as someone who remained silent? Or do you want to be remembered as someone who just saw someone else and made their life a little bit better? Showed humanity to someone who's been made inhumane. Showed dignity to someone who's been undignified. Given voice to the voiceless, power to the powerless. Then one of the new civil rights leaders of our time, use your sword and your shield. If you choose the latter, I guarantee you, wherever you are in 50 years from now, you'll be remembered as one of the happiest, wealthiest people that ever lived. Thank you very much.
of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are asking me for recruiters. And I told the police chief of this city, he was saying, how can we get the trust of the community? I said, what you need to say that we're going to quit lying to our citizens. I don't know where you draw the line at. If you have a serial killer, uh, but you use a little more savory methods, but someone who's driving a car and a license plate like it's not out, you lie to them, stop them, and make them might catch them or something, and then they get caught in the system. Right. Uh, you know, how do you feel about that, the, uh, the, the fact that law enforcement can legally lie? Um, I have lots of feelings about things that law enforcement, including prosecutors, can do. Um, but what I've learned is that very rarely are there bad actors. Um, it's more the symptoms of an institution that was built a long, a long time ago and it's never been refreshed. For me, looking at prosecutors going to work every day and thinking that like locking people up was a way to keep us safe wasn't a reflection on them as individuals, it was a reflection on the tools that we were given to do our jobs. And I guarantee you that if you ask the police officers who are in this room, if you ask the prosecutors who are in this room, uh, what would it take for you to earn back the trust of the community? They're not going to tell you that it's about lying. If, they want to, if you ask them how they want to solve their cases, it's not about lying. It's about having the community trust you enough to pick up the telephone. Right now, the problem, one of the main problems that we have is that people don't even feel safe enough to pick up the telephone. Some of it is because of that, the distrust in the institution. Some of it is our distrust in each other. Um, we need to, to think about a more restorative model that doesn't involve dishonesty to get to solutions that look like accountability. I really appreciate your question. Thank you. Hey, um, I have a question for
I am Marty Bobby Sword Justice inside of uh, Maximum Security Prison. And it was, it was men who were in Maximum Security Prison for killing people. Uh, mostly black and brown boys who had committed uh, homicide and gang crimes. And I was bringing prosecutors in to learn about the process. We were up in Albany County in Oakland. And um, a, a young man, he was 40 now, was talking about his crime. And he said, you know, I went out to the street, I went, I went to my house, I found a handgun, I went out in the street, I saw my crime, I shot him in the chest, I killed him. And you could see the prosecutor sort of like glaze over me, and he's like, God, that's cold blooded. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's accountability. Because there were victims in the room as well, survivors of the Holocaust. And being able to hear the questions that we don't get to answer in the criminal justice system. Oftentimes, like, victims just want to know, like, why me? Why this person? Why my loved one? They want other things like, you know, don't do it again, leave me alone. We can provide those things. But the amazing thing for the prosecutor was seeing the, seeing the perpetrator of that crime for the first time articulate what they had done and who they had done it to. And for the prosecutor, for prosecutors, that's like, we never get that. We get to read what we think they did and they say, yeah, I did that. But to hear true accountability, like think about when the last time you were late somewhere. Just like being late. You're like, yeah, traffic was bad, the subway broke down, and the weather, and it's like, no, we just woke up like, <laughs> like that. We have a really hard time just like fessing up the bad stuff. And so to get true accountability, and that accountability is actually healing for people. We've learned that like being accountable and understanding each other's harm is really healing. Retribution and vengeance is really toxic. You meet someone who's, who's lost a loved one to homicide 30 years after it's happened, and all they've been given as an option to heal is the incarceration of another person. Particularly when that person looks like them or comes from their community, that's not healing. But understanding that harm and forgiving, or whatever the word it is that you call it, was resolution, it's very healing. You see amazing things happen with people who've done harm to each other uh, when you go through the sort of process. It's beautiful, it's amazing, it's, good, it's great in schools. Uh, that's like my, that's the band I find. Well, first, I want to just tell you thank you for your life's work. Certainly appreciate it. Um, so, you brought up the word a few times, um, public safety. Um, and we know there is a technological revolution that is helping to build uh, what I would call a surveillance state. Uh, to the point where there is so much money being made uh, doing this. Uh, whether we're talking traffic cameras, uh, which uh, when, when they say public safety, 90% of the people that are on the road don't want to access it. But 50% might get tickets in the mail, which is a great cash uh, system way to make money. Um, but beyond that, all of the cameras that we see all over uh, most of our communities, uh, primarily uh, in our low-income communities, how do you balance uh, the message from those who are making policy in our cities with public safety uh, on top of them being able to use the electronic means and surveillance technology uh, to police us all even more than Yes. Um, great question. So for the for the economic argument, it, it baffles me that um, people don't see that like incarcerating someone for, for the most extreme case, incarcerating someone for, for 70 years costs us eleven million dollars. When like a fraction of that money can be put into something else to keep that ever from happening. Um, there's lots of money out here to be made in community development. That has nothing to do with surveilling or incarcerating people. And for every person that we keep out, we're making you know, like we're making money, we're saving money on incarcerating them, and we're making it more likely for them to contribute to the economy in some way, shape, or form. And so that's one argument. It's just like you're, you're co this is costing us money. You might be making a little bit of money, but you could be making more if you stop doing this nonsense. But the other thing is like, who are you keeping safe? Because when I talk to people in the communities where most of the violence is happening, and I ask them, you know, like, what would you feel to keep you safe? They don't say more bars, more cameras, more police. They say things like jobs and education and housing. The number one answer I get about what would keep you safe is housing. And the fact that we are more committed to putting up cameras and bars and bracelets on people's ankles than we are about putting roofs over the heads of, of kids their families, again, it's like one of these questions that we're really, we should be articulating and wrestling with all the time. Who are we? Who are we? Would we rather 
eviscerate communities in the name of public safety rather than put rooms over people's heads. Not because we're trying to give out charity, but because we're trying to reinvest our money so that we get more people in the economy. Like these are the conversations that we have to have. Thank you for your question. Go here and then we'll finish up that line. Matthew, you're going to be the last question, okay? All right. Man. I actually wanted to piggyback off of uh, the question that our educator had regarding a particular student. I think it's interesting because as, as human beings, we tend to find it really easy to address an acute, immediate crisis in the way that we just did. Um, but so I'm wondering, on a, on a wide scale, to what degree do you uh, focus on an exploration of the role of socioeconomic status in relation to um, reform and restorative justice? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is like a whole other presentation. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, everybody who's, like, the criminal justice system should be used for the 1% of people who are doing the heinous things. There's nothing else. What really is a, a finding that you don't know where to step in at is really this whole conversation of generational, you know, um, inclusion in the child welfare system, juvenile justice, you know, criminal justice system. And it's like, yeah, it may start with one person, but really what are the, the steps, you know, instead of getting overwhelmed because dollars are being taken from those programs to do other things, to um, make other people have money, you know, where do we really start in that generational issue? It's, it's so critical. Yeah, it is, and it's terrifying. Um, but we know a lot of things based on economics and math and science. The fact that Sam is a junior in college, he's a very likely to graduate in college, makes it the likelihood that his children or his children's children that do not exist yet ever touch the system. That's how we start. It is one person at a time. The question for all of us as a community is, what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to give up to put it down somewhere where people, where young people say maybe school? The number one thing that we know is once you step across that line of graduation, across the, the high school graduation line, the likelihood that you interact with the criminal justice system goes down by some precipitous effect. And that should be our North Star. Because there was never one moment where I grew up that we talked about college as a way to survive. Like, in the hood where I live now, we talk about college with young people as like, you want to live? Go to college, man. But for me, it was just like, no, no, this is just where you go after you're done. And again, as a society, like, it's unfair for us to have it one way in one community and then talk about another way in another community. And that's just about us. That's about the people in this room saying, I understand that this is unfair, and I don't want to leave this legacy to my children. We have to decide as a community really, really hard decisions to make about how do we make it so that young people who don't go to the really nice schools, young people who are going to other school alternative schools, are getting the same education, the same opportunity to stay in the same school and cross the finish line in case we aren't. Hi, Adam. Thanks again for being here. So I, you know, had the privilege and the insulation of growing up in middle class white suburbia where I didn't hear anything about, you know, the effect of mass incar incarceration or the school prison pipeline until I was in grad school. Um, and so I certainly don't want to put, you know, like the onus of the responsibility on you to be like, teach me how to help people. Um, but do you have any, like, resources or tips or anything to, like, help me bring this conversation to my family, my community, that, like, it's totally not even Tons. Tons. <laughs> um, yeah, and don't, like, don't keep it for your family, like, bring down the screen and show the 13. Like, read Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, read Stand From the Beginning, read Evicted, have a conversation with people, not just people in this room, find the people who chose to do something else today, because it's, it's really important for them to get it. Like, there's so much content out here, and that's why these are the new civil rights leaders, because um, we think about the civil rights movement as, like, this, you know, just the event that people were out and were outraged was actually like a really strategic campaign about visualizing the problem. And so that's why you see everything in the civil rights movement took place before 11 in the morning, uh, because they wanted to get on the 6 o'clock news. It's all it was about, was like, let the rest of the country see. These young people can make that happen in 10 seconds on social media. And so the fact that we have all this content and the ability to distribute it, like, civil rights movement can happen today. Um, there's lots of resources out there. I'd love to help you and educators and all the other people in the room, people in law enforcement, having a conversation with your officers about this. So important. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, I am person. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, first off, thank you for being here um, and speaking all this day. Um, I'm a freshman here at Co. Um, one of my majors is criminal justice, and for the honors program here, 
here. I'm doing my project on the problems in America with mass incarceration, prison labor, our prison systems in general. And I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier to think, oh, once I graduate college, I can make a difference. Once I get my degree, I can make a difference. But I want to start now, and I just don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm capable of doing at this point. So do you have any advice on how I can start making an impact right now in my change? Turn around. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you go to school with other people who aren't here. Um, tell them what you saw here, and, and use the resources that I'm about to give this person to like get together and do book club or whatever. It's freshman college student these days. Like <laughs> um, when you're pre gaming, I know. When you're pre gaming, <laughs> like just sit and watch the 13th and have a discussion and. Uh, one thing that is true of people who are both in the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, and the adult justice system is that connection to community is one of the biggest indicators of success on reentry. And you can do that in myriad ways as a volunteer, even as a person your age. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to go and visit um, a prisoner or a local jail. Uh, not because I want you to like have your minds blown and change, but because your tax money is your responsibility, like you're paying for it. Um, and meet people and, and make them feel like they have a connection to the community. Uh, there's lots of volunteer programs all over the place. I would encourage you to get involved with the DA's office, the law enforcement, and see what those folks do. Um, there are lots of ways that you write free, cheap, young labor would be appreciated by lots of people. Um, and I guarantee that if you like to stand in the back of the room up there, like somebody in here will give you a, give you a pass. Thank you. All right? Twelve-year-old Malcolm, everyone. Hold on. Go ahead, Hello, Mr. Fox. Um, Hello, Malcolm. Uh, my question is, what do you think brings you the most joy in what you do? What makes you happy? Come on, man. <laughs> um, what makes me happy is that last night I had a conversation with a twelve-year-old young person about the criminal justice system, and I know that having that conversation across the dinner table that you and I had, you're going to do something different to make sure that other people who look like you that don't have an amazing dad or an amazing place to come are going to have the same experiences that you do. I know that looking at you and having a conversation with you and that is like, I, if tomorrow all of this ends, I've done my job. So just like, take that out of